Hi everyone, I'm here today to review Trust by Hernan Diaz. Forgive my voice, I've been under the weather the past few days. I'm feeling much better, but my voice does not reflect that, so I don't sound the best, and I apologize for that, but I've been wanting to talk about this book for a couple of weeks, so let's just hope together that my voice survives this whole thing and doesn't give out on me, because I'm really excited to talk about trust and I don't want to put it off anymore. Because I think this is an incredible novel, I think I should just start off by saying that I loved this book, so this is not going to be a negative review. I, of course, like to think of myself as a critical reader, so while I may not critically analyze every Every single book I read, I do read things, you know, just that are, are light and fluffy and for fun sometimes. When I review books on this channel, I definitely like to take a critical eye to things. Um, not critical in terms of negativity, but critical in terms of analytical. So this re review will be uh, critical, but it is not going to be negative because I loved this book and I thought it was brilliant. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of negative reviews out there, but this is one of those situations where I almost want to be like, I don't think that they got it. I think they might be wrong. Like, I hate that attitude and I can find it to be a condescending attitude because you're allowed to not like things. Um, but I think especially if someone gave up on this book in the first section, they don't fully understand what this book is because they haven't fully experienced this book. It's four pieces of writing in one volume. And so you kind of have to experience them all into, in order to fully understand what this book is doing and respect what it's doing um, and I do feel like you need to kind of read it cover to cover in order to get that even if you just hear a summary of it I don't feel like you'll fully get what Hernan Diaz is doing here so this is like I said broken up into four pieces of writing they're all written by Hernan Diaz in reality but in this book you know they're all written by four different authors um, in this alternate fictional universe the first section is a novella that is based off of a prominent New York City couple. Um, it's a fictionalized account of their lives, their relationship, um, but it was in its day quite popular. I also think it bears mentioning that I will be talking about not necessarily spoilers because this is a difficult book to spoil in like a plot way, um, but I will be talking about each section and so for me, I think that there was some kind of like magic in discovering certain things for myself, not having known fully what was, was going on in this book and just wanting to go into it not, not knowing too much. Some of my joy as a reader and my reading experience of this was figuring out those things for myself. So if you want to not know very much about this book going in, you can walk away just knowing that I've really enjoyed it. That's my like broad takeaway. I thought it was an impressive novel, very well constructed would recommend. Um, but I think if you've read it, obviously, or if you are okay with knowing more and not necessarily feeling spoiler averse today, then stay along for the ride. Um, but I just I wanted to mention going in that this is a difficult book to talk about because it's not conventionally written. It's not written in a linear style. It's not a straightforward story. And I feel like you don't know what's going on until you reach that fourth section, or even until you've finished that fourth section. Um, do you really fully understand what you've read? Which I think is kind of remarkable because usually after about 50 pages or so you kind of get what you're reading, right? You have an assessment of whether or not you liked the book or didn't like it. Um, you have a general feeling for where things are going to go or at least like, oh I like the writing style, I'm here for the ride, or I like the characters. Whatever it is that hooks you in the beginning of a book I don't feel like really works for this because it changes after the first 150 pages or so into something entirely different and then it changes again to something entirely different in the third section. So I just need to kind of back myself up. So there's that first section um, that is the, the fictionalized novel. The second section is an unfinished memoir manuscript by the man that was fictionalized in that first section. So in the, in the novel version, He's a character named Benjamin Rask. The real man is a man named Andrew Bevel. And so the, the second section, My Life, is his memoir. Um, it's an unfinished manuscript, like I mentioned, which is really important because I didn't necessarily know slash remember that going in. And so there are some incomplete sentences, incomplete thoughts that were abrupt and kind of distracting and disorienting because I didn't realize that they were unfinished thoughts um, that it wasn't a finished idea, a finished piece, um, which is important for what it's what it is because the third section is written by the woman who ghost wrote the memoir and it's her like decades later looking back and trying to figure out more about um, Andrew Bevel's wife, Mildred who was an elusive figure um, 
spoken about very differently by her husband than as she was portrayed in the novel. Um, and to me, it really clicked into place. I had this aha light bulb moment, if you will, where I realized in the third section that this novel isn't really about um, Bevel at all. It's about his wife, Mildred. Mind blown, brilliant. Like it's all about, it's really about her. And while Bevel and, or a representation of Bevel is present in each of the pieces, it's really about Mildred and her experience and who, who was she really? Um, because you're seeing her through these, all these different lenses and all of their accounts of her are conflicting. Um, and so you're trying to piece together your understanding of her through all these other people's perspectives and writings about her. And then of course, the final section, Futures, is from Mildred Bevel's perspective. Loved it. it. But she herself, of course, isn't super reliable either, right? Because it's coming from her perspective, but she's also incredibly ill. And so there's a level of, of questioning to how forthcoming was she in her writing? Um, was she hiding things from herself? Was she, did, you know, did she have the capacity to really write how she was feeling because of her sickness? You know, was her sickness preventing her from having the energy to you know, emotionally open up to put these things on page? Was she physically just not strong enough to write these things down? Like you have so, so many questions. Um, and you use the evidence from her section, combined with all these other things that you've heard about her from her husband, from this ghostwriter, from this fictional account of her in a novel, and you try to piece together like who is Mildred? And like that is really what trust is about. And like whose perspective can you trust? Um, but it's also brilliantly woven in because like trust and bonds can be talking about relationships, but they also can be talking about money because money is also at the root of all of this because um, Andrew Bevel made his fortune on the stock market um, but he only had the the capital the the resources to have that success because of his ancestry which they made all their money from slavery and they don't really want to openly admit to that um, but they made all their they made all their fortune from the tobacco industry okay they made their money from from slave labor um, and so in that way, it's commenting about like America and capitalism because, you know, people who have all this financial success, like they didn't pull themselves up by their bootstraps. That's literally not possible. Um, that's what the, that phrase originally means is like, you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's not something that can physically be done. Um, your legacy and your, your wealth is built on something. And you're not there's no such thing as a self-made person um and that in itself the idea of, of being self-made um and there's no such thing as a self-made person is so interesting when you think about it in the context of like the way that other people view you and the way that your your legacy is told your story is told it's not self-made it's made by the impressions of everyone around you um and so it does one of my absolute favorite things in literature that i love every time it comes up when you don't even if you hear from a character directly, you learn so much more about them based on how they are written about, thought about, spoken about the, by the people around them in their lives. So it's so informative. You know, we don't necessarily hear from Andrew Bevel himself. We have his memoir, but you know, it was ghostwritten by someone else. Um, but we have such a sense of who Andrew, Andrew Bevel was based on the way that he was written in that novel, based on the way that he interacted with the ghostwriter and the way that she remembered her based on how Mildred wrote about him. And the same could be said for Mildred. The way that her husband thought about her as this kind of waifish, weak, uninteresting figure. Um, the way that she viewed herself as this great philanthropist. Um, the way that she was respected by this woman who wanted to uncover more about her in the archival record, um, even though she had been writing about her husband. It just is all so fascinating. Um, and I think just like an excellent, just, uh, such a fun character study, just absolute catnip for my English major brain because there's so much to, in, to dig in here about misogyny, marital relationships, um, gender roles in the early 20th century, money, character relationships, and you can really dig into the structure of it and, and what is the purpose of it having this really interesting structure and such skill, such craft, and the fact that Hernan Diaz has four distinct narrative voices throughout this book. Like, they don't run together. I wouldn't confuse the writing in the first section with the writing in the third or fourth, fourth section. It just wouldn't happen. Um, so this is why I'm going back to what I said at the beginning, where like, if you only read the first section, I don't think that you have a solid impression of what this book is doing or what it's about. Because that novel section at the beginning, 
is the longest section in this book, I think. And I saw some reviews saying that it was dull, which first of all, I disagree. Uh, I think that it was, it very accurately captured the feeling of like an early 20th century Gatsby-esque novel um, that's about relationships and power and money. I thought that, that it portrayed that extremely well. I'm generally a huge proponent of the DNF. You're not enjoying something, let it go. Um, but I would, I guess, question someone's judgment if they had really negative things to say about this book and they hadn't read it to completion just because I don't feel like they have a full understanding of this story. Because I think it'd be really easy to read that first section or even the first two sections and be like, this is misogynistic crap. The way that, that he's writing about these women is terrible, but like that is kind of also the point. Like that is that is true, that is be that is happening, but it's not Hernan Diaz that's saying or thinking those things, it's the characters. And you can see that and that becomes all the more clear when you read from Ida, who was the ghostwriter, um, and her perspective and all the stuff that's going on with her dad, oh my gosh, so interesting and like her her crappy boyfriend, you like learn about what was going on in her life while she was ghostwriting the book. That was also very juicy and fascinating. Um and like she's an extremely well-rounded character because you see you've learned so much about her based on her relationship to Bevel and her relationship to her father and her relationship to her boyfriend like that third section in and of itself I think is just like chef's kiss beautiful um but like you really get to, you get to hear from Mildred at the end which I just thought was such a catharsis such a necessary catharsis for understanding the the end of this book and understanding Mildred and and being able to draw your own conclusions as a reader I don't think that anything is really super spelled out for the reader I don't think that Hernan Diaz is, is like drawing a bunch of arrows at a particular point and being like, look here, look here, there's the point, you found it at the end. Um, I think that there are a lot of conclusions that can be drawn about what is true, what is not. I think that's another part of the genius of this novel is that, is that it's not all put uh, on a platter for the reader. It's, that's not a metaphor, I don't think. Um, but it's not all spelled out for you. I, there is some work that you have to do to piece these things together like you're almost a detective a literary fiction detective if you will trying to figure out these characters and understand them but unlike a straightforward mystery novel there's not an obvious conclusion there's not an obvious answer um, I think there are still unanswered questions that the reader has to conclude for themselves how they feel um, what they think really happened uh, what was really going on, who these characters really were, which is ultimately what it's like to know another person, right? Like, ultimately your impression of someone else is only, is an incomplete piece. Like, you'll never fully know another person or how another person views themselves in their entirety. Um, every person views every other person in the world differently, at least slightly. Um, so we don't get the full pictures of everything, but that's how life goes. Um, is we don't get the full pictures of anything, um, which I also just think makes this book all the more brilliant. But if you don't like things that don't wrap up with a pretty bow at the end, um, I don't think that you'll like this because it's not conclusive. It's not super tightly wound up at the end. Um, and it doesn't end with like a big bang or anything. It just, I just thought it was perfect the way that it ended. And I had a delightful time reading and interacting with this book, especially in the second section um with the the fictionalized memoir there were i was just talking back to andrew bevel i was like come on dude um because it's so funny he writes all these things about his father and his grandfather and then he's got the section for his mother i don't think you can see that but it's just blank because he hasn't filled in that part yet and it's like I, I literally wrote come on dude didn't have any time to write about your mom i think it says so much so much good stuff about how much we can truly know a person and also um, the flawed nature of memory and like all these things sound really cliche coming out of my mouth But they don't sound cliche coming out of this book. So I would just highly recommend this It's one of the most delightful reading experiences I've had all year I think in part because I chose this as my inaugural book club pick it ended up just being like an excellent book club pick If you have some if you need to pick something for your book club I think this is a fabulous pick there was so much to discuss We talked for like two hours about this book and I didn't know any of those people It was our first book club meeting we'd never met before we had a brilliant discussion and there was so much to talk about. Everyone really liked the book. Um, so yeah, I would highly recommend this for a book club. Um, hopefully my next book club is even more successful. We'll have to see. Which by the way, if you want to be a part of my book club, I'm extending it to Patreon. So I've got an in, in real life book club, which is my attempt to make friends in my new town um, as I am relatively new to New Jersey and I'm trying to make friends. Um, but I also thought it'd be fun to extend it onto the bookish internet. I have picked 
the Hacienda by Isabel Cañas. Just a quick plug here at the end of the video. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on Trust. If you've read it, what you thought about it. I feel like I have so much more to say, but as I mentioned at the beginning, I've been a little under the weather the past few days, so my, my mind isn't the clearest, but this is just, you know, what has come to mind as I've been sitting here wanting to gush about this book for weeks on end. It makes me want to read uh, Hernan Diaz's other novel so badly. I've already purchased it. It's called In the Distance. It's a, a Western, which I never read, but I bought it because I'm here for Hernan Diaz. I'm totally sold. And I would love to hear what you thought about Trust if you've read it or if you want to read it now based on my review, if you made it to the end of this. Oh, thank you so much if you did. Um, I appreciate you more than you could ever know, truly. Me and my, my croaky little voice here at the end. Um, you don't know how much I appreciate you watching and commenting on my video. So if you have anything to say, I would love to hear it in the comments. And let's keep the conversation going. And I look forward to hearing from you. Subscribe for more bookish stuff. Check out my Patreon if you're interested. And I will see you hopefully in the next one.